Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Eddie. And uh, congratulations to Eddie and Barry. I, I get to present at many section meetings. This section presentation I've just seen was off the charts, better than anywhere I've ever been. So congratulations to the team that put this together. Uh, I reckon I've been sandbagged, actually, because as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from Dallas, really. <laughs> and I did notice the reference to the Boston Tea Party. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not sure about the audience I've got. <laughs> I haven't got the rifle, I haven't got the gun, but all your, all your chairs are plugged in. So any heckling, <laughs> I've got the button. Now I'm going to take my jacket off as well. And I also want to tell you, I'm not a golf professional. I've never been a golf professional. Haven't seen what you have to do. I'm not sure I want to be a golf professional. So I'm not here to tell you anything about hit, hit a five iron. Um, I'm what you expect to see on any given Saturday, high, wide and right. Oh, that's a good shot. Um, what I do know how to do, and I've spent my entire life doing, is working out how to get a product from where it's made or grown to the consumer as fast as possible. Um, and most of that was spent in North America, despite my accent. <coughs> so I worked on things like supply chains, they would call them, and on marketing and demand chains. So that's my expertise, and that's frankly what I'm good at. I'm here today because of a PGA professional. I was sitting in the first tea, uh, a practice tea, listening to a guy called David Christie, great PJ golf professional, trying to take a member and sell him a Mizuno MP001, if you remember that driver. Uh, and he was struggling because the member, being you know a bit tight, wanted a discount. And David was trying to get him through the process and say, look, <laughs> I can't discount anymore, I'm already giving you 10%, I don't make that much on it. And I got irritated because um, they would make a lot of noise and I valued David, he had made a big difference to my, my game of golf. So I wandered across there <coughs> and said to Josh, Josh, I'll tell you what, if Dave, you don't mind, Dave's going to give you this driver for cost. Absolutely what it cost him. One proviso. If you let David fit it, give you the right loft, right shaft, right, right grip, gives you a little bit of a lesson, you're going to give him a hundred rand per extra yard he gives you. Josh was up for it. David made four times the margin he would have made off of that sale. That's a genuine story. The reason, David was selling him a result. And that's something I want to have in your minds as we go through this presentation. People want the result. The process doesn't really matter. They want the result. Now as I go through this presentation, I better offer a few apologies up front. I'm, I'm highly opinionated. I've got lots of opinions about your area uh, because I've worked around it, but I may be wrong and you may disagree with me. Feel free to disagree uh, as I go through this. I'm also going to insult you uh, as we go through. Oh, this is my opening. So, you know, when Jeff said, uh, marketing, you're not bad, uh, he's wrong. You are crap at marketing. So there's the first uh, insult out, out, out the door, okay? So you are really, really bad at it. And you're really bad at it when you are so good at what you do. I see so many people good at marketing a crap product. By the way, I use cuss words, forgive me. A crap product, and they sell the life out of it. You guys are great at what you do, and you can't sell the life out of it. That's my view, anyway. Okay. What I hear, and, and by the way, I'm going to disagree with RT. You're not in a relationship business. Please, for anything I get through at the end of this presentation, I want you to say, aha, I'm not in the relationship business. Now, whilst I to tell you a story, that this, that I'll break it into two parts and actually show you how you are much more than the relationship business. January the 4th, I don't get to play much golf. The continental head of HSBC Bank, how I know him, I don't know, but he asked me what I couldn't play golf with him. He had just joined the country club. So I went along, I hadn't played for a few months, I was really nervous about the situation, especially at the country club. Uh, I have to go in and announce myself at the front desk, I have to you know, prove I had a handicap, prove I was a member of a golf club, all that sort of thing, show I had the right attire. I got there, desk about this high, the assistant professional was sat, beside, sat down, he didn't get up, but he was going to struggle to get up because he had a woman on his knee. 
Okay. So uh, he asked me all these questions, sat there with his wooden on his knee, you know, on his, that, on his full computer answering it. Next to me is the continental head of HSBC, one of the biggest banks in the world. He, he then said, this is going to cost you this much. So I said, okay, I handed him my credit card. He still didn't get up, he pointed at the credit card machine. I put it in, put my PIN number in. But where I went, he didn't offer me any golf balls. So I asked, he said, they're in the bucket behind you. I've got the golf balls brought, had to pay again. Didn't get up once, Phil didn't go off his knee. We walked out the front door, this poor head of HSBC Bank, his country club was embarrassed. So embarrassed, he said to me, I have to apologise, she wasn't even good looking. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to tell you the second half of this story in a minute, because he's very competitive. But what we experienced there was an assistant professional who didn't ask me anything about myself that was relevant to was I a potential future player at this golf club or even a potential future member at this golf club. Not one piece of information did he want. Didn't want my email address, didn't want to know I live local. Just knew I was a member of a golf club, but that was on another continent, so didn't ask was I here visiting. There was nothing about this welcoming me and asked me to join a golf club that, by the way, has openings. And in fact, that's the way golf markets itself. Keep out. It marketed itself through the 90s and 80s and 70s and 60s on elitism and exclusivity. Beg and we'll let you in. And in an age when we are desperate for new golfers, this continental head of HSBC only joined this golf club because he rang me, because he knew I'm in the golf business, and said, I need to join a golf club. I'm moving to this city, do you know one? So I said, yes, I do know one, but let me make a phone call for you. So I phoned the golf club manager and explained to him that the continental head of HSBC was coming to live in his area. And he said, well, he's gonna have to go through all the same process, right, the normal processes. He's going to have to get a member to nominate him, and we're going to have to check his background, and blah, 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 and gave me about 15 minutes of reasons why we might not accept this person in our golf club. Not once did he ask me any questions about, does he have a budget? Does he want to market? Does he want to use our golf club for anything? There was none of those questions. It was all what he's going to have to do to join this golf club. Now, I've, that doesn't surprise me, because we have previously done surveys well, actually, we go out, because I had a punch-up with the Golf Club Managers Association president in another country, who told me, actually, that's not the way it is. So we went to a little shopping centre locally and did a survey. I had the same problem repeated in Newport Beach, where I had a phone call from a multi-millionaire who just happens to be an investor in our business, and said, I've got a friend who's also a multi-millionaire who plays a bit of golf and wants to join a golf club. Can you help me? So I phoned the section head in Southern California. He gave me three local pros to Newport Beach. I called them all, gave them all the details of this person. Not one of them ever made a phone call to him. Not one. So please don't tell me you're any good at marketing. That's the simple, that's not even marketing 101. And to make it worse, we did a survey at Newport Beach. We went into the big mall there and we asked, we looked for, if you'll forgive me, this wasn't a racist or sexist, we looked for 100 white males between 30 and 55 because we figured those were the people that golf clubs traditionally have been most content with. And actually we asked them, are you a member of a golf club? Are you a casual golfer if you're not a member? Have you been a member who's not playing golf anymore? And we also asked them, has anybody ever asked you to be a member of a golf club? Now just think about this, because you've seen the golf to the O stats in this section. 61 million people said they want to play golf. Actually, we found 42 people that play golf who had never been asked if they wanted to, if they could join the golf club. Never been asked by another golfer or a golf professional golf club. We live in an industry still where we expect them to come to us. Hence, what we've started to introduce is a term, the Rainmaker. It's got nothing to do with my, uh, our company, and by the way, it's nothing to do with our company in this presentation, it's all educational. A Rainmaker in the business world is your most important employee. He's the person who goes out there and gets the business. Without that person, you have no business. And the golf industry has a problem because it doesn't have rainmakers. 
It's got people waiting for people to come to them. You have got to change that. And the best person in this industry to be the rainmaker is the PGA professional. There was a question about golf club managers associations. Two weeks ago I was in New Orleans presenting to the golf club managers at their golf club managers congress uh, of America. Mike Liam Ace was there, Jim Tindling, the whole lot were there, and 500 golf club managers. I didn't have one dissenting voice when I told them you need to place your PGA professional out front centre as the rainmaker for your facility. If you don't do that, golf is going to continue to decline. <coughs> that is the role your golf professional should have. Your golf professional should not be behind the counter or in the office collecting the money to pick Gene's story. So I keep hearing PGA professionals tell me their golf club don't want them playing golf and don't want them teaching. And I understand that that happens. Believe me, I've been involved in interventions where I've seen that. But in every intervention I've been in, as Jeff said, I haven't seen the PJ professional present a piece of paper to the golf club manager explaining how he can change the revenue line. I'm not surprised when we get 42 out of 100 people who play golf have never been asked to join a golf club. I've got a, and, and by the way, the rest of the industry thinks you're crap at marketing as well. Here's a magazine. It's a, um, uh, it's a question, by the way, I'm getting older. Mark King, CEO of uh, and President of Taylor Made Golf, asked the questions. Opening question out of just five. Congratulations on the success of the R11. How many extra golfers do you think is attracted to the game? It's the Mark King and a white driver is going to attract golfers. Now, if I could read the little print, because that was just the headline, I'd tell you that he goes on to say, the numbers aren't in yet. We think we've made an impact. Holy crap! You know? <laughs> but, he says, we're all hoping, and this is very poignant given yesterday, we're all hoping Tiger gets back on the horse, because then we can grow the game. So there we go again. There's the man, CEO and president of one of the biggest golf companies, sitting, he doesn't think you're going to grow the game. He thinks Tiger Woods is going to grow the game, along with CBS and his white drivers. Which, hopefully in his wet dreams, driver one day, uh, Tiger will one day play. <laughs> okay. <laughs> do you really think, do you really think the guy in charge of programming at CBS or whoever wants you to get off your couch when you've watched Tiger nail the fairway wood and rush out and start playing golf? Do you really think they want that? Or do you think they want you to stay on that sofa or couch or wherever you're sat and watch the next program? Watch The Mentalist tonight. They don't even run adverts between one episode and the next episode. They feed you from the end of one straight into the next program so you won't even get up and make a cup of tea. Or coffee, sorry. Or go to Starbucks and get it, of course, isn't it? Okay. The growth of this game and I don't think I need to sell it to you, but you really have to believe what your officers said to you earlier. There's no PGA National going to grow the game. There's not even these fancy guys in their suits going to grow the game. There's PGA professionals at golf clubs who are going to grow this game. And there are hundreds and thousands of you. You shouldn't need, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but you shouldn't need television advertising. Your reach is quite enormous. The amount of people you touch and can touch and to grow the game is way beyond anybody else can do. And that's why you need to be the rainmakers for this industry. Now, I just want to complete my introduction, by the way. Um, you have detected from my accent that I have British parents, I would like to say. I, um, so that gives me the right to have these opinions and to carry on having opinions when I have no knowledge of any subject. That's the British <laughs> skill. Um, I am actually I am actually also South African, really, which gives me the opinion to tell you these opinions, okay, which I will do. And uh, I'm now based out of Dallas, Texas, so uh, we know we're right and y'all wrong. <laughs> so anybody wants to disagree with me. But I want you to do a bit of work now. Okay, I want all of you to start, and we're going to go back to marketing point one. I want you to spend 
15 seconds, so I'm not going to say anything for 15 seconds, which you might not believe, but I want for 15 seconds you to think of one word, one word you want your members or golfers to say when they think about you. One word. Write it down. Write your word down. Come on. I'm not starting again until you've written the word down. <laughs> Come on, it must be a word. I'm not going to ask you for it because I won't embarrass you, don't worry. By the way, the president of the North Texas PGA section shouted out his word and you'll see why that was embarrassing in a minute. Okay. These are words I hear. Everybody comfortable with those words? We've got those words? Anybody want to shout any other words? Friendly. Sorry? Friendly. Friendly. Personality. Personality. Inviting. Pardon? Inviting. Inviting. Sorry. Caring. Caring. Passionate. Professional. That's up there. Passionate. Passionate. Okay, that's not up there. You took my wet dreams a bit far, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. There's a challenge. There's a challenge with these words. Um, and by the way, uh, the president of the North Texas PJ section shouted out, "Expert!" before I even got this line up. To which I now had to say, "Those are really not good words." <laughs> okay. And the reason those are not good words is because they're about you. Those words are about you. What you want your customer to think is a word, actually, about you having an impact on them. Go back and think about all those Apple adverts you see for the iPad. They don't tell you the size of the screen, they don't tell you the weight of the iPad, they don't tell you the processor speed, they don't tell you any of those things. It's how would you like to learn a new language? How would you like to teach your child how to spell? There's any number of things that, about the customer achieving something. And when people think of Apple, they think about Apple in terms of the impact it's having on their lives. And that's how customers are. They're very, very selfish. They might think of you as passionate, they might think of you as passionate, and they might think of you as professional. But they're much more interested in what you can do for them. And that's why crap companies are able to market because they work out what's the impact they're going to have on somebody and they market that impact. They don't market the product. So a company like Hewlett Packard, who by the way had a far superior tablet to Apple technically, came, went and disappeared because all they ever told people was about how great their tablet was. They didn't talk about the impact on a person's life. But if you think Apple's a bit fancy-dancy, let's come down to Coca-Cola. This is the iconic American brand, and I know Pepsi supports um, the PGA, so forgive me, but Coca-Cola. They talk to you about Coca-Cola and its impact on your life. If you've got to come up with a word and ask any, any Coca-Cola executive, give me one word, they wouldn't come up with brown sugary liquid with chemicals. They wouldn't talk about themselves. They'd talk about refreshing, invigorating. We deliver the Coke moment. And look at their advertising. It's all about times of happiness and joy and the impact that can have on you. That's smart advertising. And they've got, Coke are so good at this, they've got the word Coke moment into people's minds. Now before I close that little section, and I think it's very important that, by the way, it sounds very subtle, but I sat in, for Daryl Crawl, I sat in seven workshops where he asked golf professionals, and there was about 15 each, each workshop, why, what they enjoyed most about being a PGA professional. So it's over 100 professionals. Not one of them ever mentioned the customer, or the impact they could have on the customer. Now, let's not criticise them, because I wonder in this room if we did the same thing. You wouldn't say love of the game, camaraderie, the spirit, those sorts of things. 
when I heard Gene, I think it was, talking, telling his story at the begin early on, it might have been very heartfelt, but I wanted to jump up and down and celebrate, because there was a guy talking about the impact he had. So it's a very important point. And your opportunity is enormous, because if you place any average 16 handicapper, five iron in hand, you've got one of four options. He's nailing the green, going for a birdie putt. He's going right into the water. He's chunking it east short, or he's pulling it straight left. How many of you are giving that 16 handicapper, hey, he's going to nail the green, and he's putting for a birdie? How many of you? He's not going to do it. You know he's not going to do it. In fact, if you're paying him, you are sat there thinking, he's going for that green. I know where the ball's going. I've got the money on this hole. Okay. But what do you think he feels, as a golfer, when he does pull it off? How does he feel? He feels elated. In fact, that's a difference for you, and you guys have got to get out of this. You play around and you think, oh, I had a bad shot on four, I had a bad shot on eight, and oh, I hadn't three putted on twelve. That's how you guys think. These guys who are playing golf every day don't think like that. They come off the end of their round and they remember the three good shots. Let's have and help hope they had three good shots because then they might come back. That's what they remember. And they get home, anybody asks them, in fact, you listen to the bar, all they're talking about is their good shots. That's the experience the golfer wants. The golfer wants to take a five iron out the bag, hit it, feel it nailed, see it so high, see it land on the green and stop. And from a marketing perspective, that's where you've got to get your mind. I don't give a shit you know my name. But if you can help me nail a five iron, you're my hero. So let's close this story. That head of HSBC, 16th hole, he's two up on me, which was, uh, he, he was reminding me of. He was a bit shaky. I got back to, t to two, I was on my way down. On a very difficult par five with water down the left, he pulls out a driver, not the hybrid to come short of the water. I think I've got him here, because if he doesn't go water, the water's going to worry him a little. He's going right into all the rubbish. He nails his drive. And he's down in the middle of the fairway. I've taken my hybrid, I'm nicely in the fairway, but a long way behind him. I hit it up, actually I hit it up just a little short of that creek. He then takes the three wood out. I'm doing little jumps inside me. I think he's going for the green. There's trees on the right. I've got this whole one back in this game. He pulls the three wood out and he screams it. And I hear him utter, I hear him utter you beauty Andrew. And I think, whoa, what's his fairway wood called? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew is Andrew Wildman. He's a PJ professional who had been coaching him. And he had been to Andrew the previous week, so I just can't hit a fairway wood. And here he had done it. And this guy was putting for eagle, he missed it, otherwise I would <laughs> Sank the birdie, won the hole, won the game. We came off the 18th, he doesn't remember the situation in the pro shop. He doesn't remember the girl on the knee, he remembers nothing about it. The only texts I received from this guy are, <laughs> If I got that eagle, I would have asked you for double. He just goes on and on at me about that shot. That for him was the Coke moment, Coke moment of 2012. Coca-Cola cannot compete with that. And every time you help a golfer do that, you have done far more than the most iconic brand in this country, in the world. That's the difference you make. And that's going to start this presentation out by saying, you aren't half bad at marketing. I would have used a crap word again, somebody walked out, somebody offended them. But you are half bad at marketing, okay? Because when you deliver that, it's a level of happiness and joy to a golfer. And that's the happiness and joy we need them to find a lot more often. So when you think about your word, the word you want the golfer to think about, don't think, like when I read what PJ Professionals write, don't think about what you are. Don't tell us what you are. Tell us what the golfer wants. It's what you deliver that counts. If you can deliver that, you're a hero to at least one member. If you can deliver that to lots of members, there's more golf and you're a hero to the golf club. That's what you're trying to deliver. That's what your brand is all about. Some use the word brand 
great use of the word brand, that's what you deliver. Yeah, how do you do it? You improve performance, connect golfers, add enjoyment. Yes. And yeah, what you are as a PGA professional, the brown sugary liquid. That's what you are. But you are the only people I know in the golf industry can deliver that. A white R11 cannot deliver that. You deliver it. So, what I would like you to do, you don't have to do it now, but I would love you to go back to you with your staff and actually go through that thought process with them. And I'd love you to say, what do we want to deliver to our golfers? Now, I was doing this with Ken Wayland. You may some, because he's the next state over, you may know him at um, Glenwald uh, this last week. And, and all Ken kept coming up with was things to do with relationship. Know their names, know their birthdays, know their children. You know, that's service. But you're much more than service. You are service plus. There's got to be a difference you're making related to golf, or I might as well employ a concierge. I don't see too many people here who want to be concierges. And you need to turn that thought process back to your golf club. Now, I get asked, I get, with the golf clubs I work with, I work with about 1,400 around the world. I'll often get PGA professionals say to me, management will ask me some questions. They'll ask them to see me, uh, it's tomorrow, I've produced this report, can take a look at it. And the reports always start, I'm a 26 year PGA veteran. Master, blaster, this and that. Okay. <laughs> they never start, and this is to the golf club management, they never start with, I'm here to deliver extra revenues. I'm here to make sure the membership is retained. I'm here to make sure we get more golfers playing the game. They never start like that. They start with who they are. So this pervades your whole thinking. So please, go back with your staff and think about what's the impact you want to make to your golfers and what's the impact you want to make to your golf club management. And if you want a shortcut, and you can shortcut, and by the way, you can have any of this stuff that's here. But I think this is what you're here to do. So here's an opinion coming. I think you're here to inspire more golfers to play golf more often. I think you're here to improve more golfers so they have more fun playing golf and play golf more often. I think you're here to include golfers in more activity, in more groups, to introduce them to more people so that they will belong and therefore play golf more often. And I think you are here to increase participation, rounds and revenues. To me, you are here to inspire, improve, include, increase. And those, in my opinion, should be mantras to PGA professionals. So when you start a conversation with your golf club management, start with what I deliver. And then go into what you do. And by the way, as an appendix, here's my qualifications and here, here is what I can offer you in terms of my background. That's my tenure. Don't start with your tenure. Start with what you deliver. And I know that's a challenge. By the way, I know that's a challenge because I work with golf clubs as well. I know that the biggest problem, I, the first words out of most golf club managers, my golf professional either hides in the office or wants to play golf all day. Well, I don't know why he doesn't go be a touring pro is another one. Okay. So my conversation has to start with each golf club manager along the lines of, well, what results are you looking for from your golf club professional? Are you looking for him to be a concierge? Or is there something more than that you want? So I put the pressure back on them. Make them think about what they really want from their golf professional. But you really need to actually do this as well. I, I can't come to 1,400 golf clubs and I can't come to 14,000 golf clubs. And nor should you expect your employment consultant to do that. You should be able to have a very simple conversation. That is point two, please take away from this presentation. That is a marketing model used by every major brand in the world. They realize that to market a product, they first have to inspire customers to want to use it. They then know they've got to find a way to get the customer to engage with the product. So if I'm Audi, I might inspire them by getting an Audi in placement in some fancy uh, uh, movie somewhere with technical driving, but I need to get the customer into the Audi in the dealer. Because when he's touching, feeling and driving the car, test driving the car, he's engaging with it. Then the salesman can convert it to a sale. 
And once he's converted, what can we do to retain them? And I was so impressed with your section because three of those they've covered, haven't they? What are you going to do your strategies to inspire? What are you going to do strategies to engage? And what are you going to do strategies to retain? Now, where's my magazines? The rest of the industry, there is a part of the industry that knows what the customer wants. Every golf magazine I pick up, yeah, that's got a picture of Ernie Els, but it doesn't mention him. It says, rev up your backswing for 20 more yards. There's the result. Train your brain, shaft flex muscles, finish with a flourish. Get better fast, play and improve. There's a result. So the magazines understand that the golfer thinks about themselves and not Tiger Woods. The magazines understand that the result the reader wants is for themselves. So they understand, so as a validation of what I'm saying to you, start thinking about the result the golfer wants. And that is why I believe there is no better rainmaker in the golf industry. Because you are the person that can inspire somebody to want to improve. Now, a person that wants to improve plays more golf. Chat to John Lieberger at Congressional. They have stats and stats and stats. Anybody they get into lessons for the first time who's a member, they've tracked, plays a minimum of 20% more golf over the next 12 months. The reason? They're trying to put into practice the things they're learning. Now, I'm a skiing fanatic as well. Uh, my wife, oh, she's not so keen on getting up so early. So I have to work on making her understand, well, what are we trying to do to improve this week? And, and get her into the same thought process. So that she wants to improve. So her day isn't just about scrambling around the slopes. Her day is about how do I get to become a better skier? Then she's very happy to be out from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock and then in the pub afterwards. <laughs> to the point that my legs are absolutely knackered today. But that was because she wanted to improve. Now I think there's nobody better than you guys to implement that model. So I would spend some time getting that model if we're going to grow the game into your golf club management mindset because it's not just you, it's every brand in the world works with it. And one of the reasons I am a fan of Get Golf Ready and the, the advert I just saw was fantastic because it closes off the gap is that's a result. It tells a person, in five days I'm going to get you get golf ready, and by the way, it gives a price, $99. Very easy proposition, the customer understands it. That's what you need to get at. You don't give lessons, you deliver a result. What's the result you deliver? A lesson's just a process. Now, I'm not going to sell golf 2.0 to you, so don't panic, Eddie, I'm not going to go through this, but this slide for you is extremely powerful with your golf club. So those of you worrying about your jobs and your tenure and how to convince the golf clubs the way to go forward, this is the most majestic slide. Two reasons. One, it's got stats and stats of great data on it. Secondly, secondly, it's been produced by somebody else. So the Boston Consulting Group, which many of your finance people and presidents at golf clubs will have heard of, produced this. So it's not you. It's not the PGA with a buyer story. And what you can do is take them through, and I would encourage you to sit. If you want to transition to being a rainmaker, we have to first get them to see the problem, and we then have to bring it local. That's another great thing your section is doing. Every other section is just sticking with this, here's the Golf 2.0 story, we're going to invent 62 million new golfers in April, or whatever the stat is, which nobody can buy into. Your section has taken this down and said, what are your goals? Each of you 30 golfers just from Get Golf Ready. That's a very nice, easy, simple goal, and I don't think they should be pleading with you to do this. But here's what I'd do. I'm going to tell you what I would do in my golf club management now. And by the way, it's what I do do with your golf club management when I speak to them. And golf club owners, and club court, and Billy Casper Golf. There's some indisputable facts that that slide shows us. And be patient, take them through these facts because we need to lead them to a result we want to get here and that is you out front and centre. We've got a serious churn problem in this industry. We've lost 90 million golfers, that's what the stats tell us. People used to play the game, that's worse than the health club industry. Now, I know some of these people died, but 90 million people, okay, that's a hell of a churn problem, and if you put it into context, you lost a million last year. In the United States, you lost a million. Now, I then show them, 
So these all come from that science, they're just fancy graphs. I show them actually you've got 14 million people there who are only occasional. But only 6 million of them said they want to play more golf. So where do you think the next set of churns coming from? There's 8 million occasional golfers who actually don't want to play more golf. And in economic hard times, or pressure from family, or pressure from any other situation, that's a lot of at-risk people. And, as I've told you, it's getting worse every year. So those are three indisputable facts I take golf club management through. And guess what? I've never had anybody do anything but nod his head. And that's good, because we want to lead them to something just now. So what I said to them, right, well the conclusion I, I draw is we've got a retention problem in this industry. A serious retention problem. Golf club manager now, what can we do? He's agreed with the three facts. <coughs> this is a fact. So we need better strategies. We need them to think they need to change. That's why you take them through that. We need to change. We need better strategies for retention. But those graphs also give us opportunity. It tells us we've got 61 million laps golfers who want to play the game again. I know that because I go around Newport Beach and other places and I'm a nerd asking people, has anybody ever asked you to play the game? There's, there's a lot of people, 61 million people. Indisputable fact, Boston Consulta Group tell us that. So we need to have much better strategies to engage with those golfers to get them to play the game. So Mr Golf Club Manager, more retention with more engagement. <laughs> now. I then go into, you can choose, because this isn't Boston Consulting Group, I then go into our view. And our view is, never mind Gen Y, with millennials you have got a hell of a problem coming. This is the we generation. They are so disconnected from your point of reference. Think about it, when you were a child, think about the devices and gadgets you had. You were lucky if you had a phone in your house connected to a wire. You know, these guys are all over the place watching TV on the go. Now the, the challenge CBS has it now is not a person getting off the couch and going to make a cup of coffee or do something else. The challenge CBS has is that person on the couch actually going to look at another screen, pulling out their pocket and doing something else. That's the biggest challenge. You know, you tell a millennial, five hours, and over five hours you'll get to hit 90 shots, most of the time it's a failure and three hours of doing nothing. <laughs> it's not very attractive, and by the way, if you get a birdie, you don't get any extra powers. <laughs> okay. That's what the millennials think, give them what's different next hole? It's not the same again, is it? Surely it's something different, that's a different letter, it's the, well, surely we've got something different. That's the way they think. You've got to get thinking like that. Golf club in the United Kingdom, we talked about this, this is, so most of any good ideas I'll ever have come from a PJ professional. So he ran Sunday afternoon Wii competition. He went and bought three Wii's, stuck them in the clubhouse, and Sunday afternoon family coming out for supper, uh, lunch, and then he ran a competition for the kids on the Wii's. And with a trophy every week and the whole thing. He called me up about eight weeks later and said, you know what, I've had to ban the adults. <laughs> Because the adults wanted to come do it. Sunday, Sunday lunch packed out at the golf club. So rather than fight the wee generation, let's exploit what they want. Why has every golf club not got a wee screen up playing closest to pin or whatever it is somewhere in that golf club? So the kids can do that and get familiar with your golf environment. And I'm not going to bore you with that. You, your, your section has done this so very well. Uh, there's a change in women. So, we have got a problem. It's not a co economically based. We have got a serious problem with this next generation coming through. You need much better strategies to inspire those people and get golf ready is a really neat way to get people into this game. I then have a number of facts I can use. You can also use them if you want. Mike Heister can, I don't know if any of you know him. His club manager said to me, we went, I did some research with his club manager uh, in November. At the end of the research, the club manager said to me, do you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that if Mike played with the applicant before, uh, as part of the process of applying, I was four times more likely to get the check and the member than if Mike didn't play with an applicant. Now what, that's not a surprise to me, but that's the stats we ought to have. Golf professionals playing with applicants convert them into members. 
Peter Myers, real case, you can all contact him. He's introduced 155 new members to his golf club that was in commercial trouble. No discount on joining, no discount on fees. When around him, golf clubs are discounting. Did it in 13 months. And the way he did it was by changing his orientation, thinking about his customers, and actually putting in place, somebody said it in your section here, another great thing about your section,